welcome back to part two of my 10 reasons why I've chosen to homeschool this year. So I just want to apologize that it's taken me so long to get this video posted and out to you. I took a little break after filming my first five reasons that went way longer than I was expecting it to. If you haven't watched that video yet, I'll post it down below. But I thought I would come back and film up here in my living room. It's a little more bright and you can see it has a little more of my kids' uh, personality. There's some green pencil crayon on the wall. Uh, yeah, that's the reality. But I thought I'd film up here. It's a little more sunny. Uh, since I began filming and just sharing these 10 reasons with you, I did a crazy thing. Uh, I guess this is the theme of my life in this season. But I did a crazy thing and I've decided to start a YouTube channel, which is totally out of my comfort zone. But uh, I thought, well, I'm going to be at home a lot more. And so I'm really going to need and I really would love to have a, uh, a community of incredible people around me. And so I'd love to invite you just to be part of this journey with me. And uh, it's a way for me to, even though I'm at home, from my home, I can be in your home and uh, and you can be living life with me. So I just wanna thank you for inviting me into your home. And if you have not yet, uh, take a minute, subscribe at the button below. I don't know how to do all this, it's all new, but if you subscribe, then you can get notifications if you click on the bell and then we can do this life thing together because we are living in crazy times and. I don't know about you, but I need people to do this, this crazy adventure with. So without further ado, let's jump in to number six of 10 reasons why I've chosen to homeschool my kids this year. guys we'll grab a coffee I've just brewed a beautiful another cup of look at that froth and I thought I'd try a little cinnamon on there for my buddy Jessica who has cinnamon with her coffee mm. I thought I'd try it it's delicious mm, so good so let's jump in we are on number six of the reasons why I've chosen to homeschool um, so the, I'm just gonna read off of my computer here. And so if I'm looking down, that is what I'm looking at. So the sixth reason why I've chosen to homeschool my kids is because I believe that homeschooling will teach my children that their ideas and that their desires and their interests are legitimate. I wanna teach my children to raise their voice, not just their hand. I wanna train them to have a vibrant, mind that thinks and explores and asks hard questions and when I look at the future and what is shaping in the world I really see the need for courageous men who will speak up when they see injustice and who will th think for themselves um, so I've told you that I've been doing lots of reading lots of research this is a book that uh, I've stumbled upon. It is called Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. It is an exceedingly challenging book to read. Uh, not, it's an easy read. It's an, um, he's compiled a bunch of essays. He is a seasoned vet teacher. He's taught for uh, over 30 years. It, he's taught in schools with very high poverty levels and he's taught in the Upper West End, Manhattan, New York for several years in the public school system. Uh, something that he identifies that I thought was really remarkable is he identifies that genius is like an inherent quality in the human spirit, that we are all made so uniquely and so, um, 
remarkably and that the public school system largely beats that out of you. Now, he doesn't necessarily say that in, in those words, but um, again, it's a really convicting read. So, good students wait for the teacher to tell them what to do. This is what the most important lesson of all is. We must wait for other people better trained than ourselves to make the meaning of our lives. The expert makes all the important choices. Only I, the teacher, can determine what my kids must study, or rather, only the people who pay me can make those decisions, which then I enforce. If I am told that evolution is a fact instead of a theory, I transmit that as ordered, punishing deviants who resist what I have been told to tell them to think. This power to control what children will think lets me separate successful students from failures very easily. Successful children do the thinking I assign them with a minimum of resistance and a decent show of enthusiasm. Of the millions of things of value to study, I decide what few we have time for. Actually though, this is decided by my faceless employers. The choices are theirs. Why should I argue? Curiosity has no importance in the place of my work, only conformity. Oh, so, oh, my phone is on low battery. Hopefully we can get through this in enough time. So just this idea of, of um, teaching children that their thoughts, their ideas, their interests aren't of value, that the, this driving machine of the public school system and whatever is enforced from the people, the elites at the top, that it all trickles down and that's what is truth. And like, ugh, don't even get me started on this whole evolution thing. I mean, that's a whole thing for another time, but that's just one example of many. And I want my kids to know, I want them to know without a shadow of a doubt that the things that God has put into them, the ideas, the perspectives, the, un the unique fibers of their being are necessary. They're not just important, they're not just valuable, they are necessary. And I, I, I want my boys to know that they should not only just raise their hand, they need to raise their voice. God has given each one of us a unique voice. And I believe with everything, uh, and the, ol the older I get, I believe this with more and greater conviction. God has given each of us a, a special message to impart to the world. There's only, our uniqueness is so valuable to the heart of God. The, I mean, when I consider that God has given us each a unique fingerprint, that our DNA makeup, no one ever in history has had the same one. No one who's living on the earth today has our unique DNA blueprint. No one in the future of anyone who will ever be born will have our unique DNA imprint and our fingerprints. Like, this is God shouting to us that we are unique for a reason. He doesn't want us to just be a number in a classroom. He doesn't just want us to fit in with the crowd. He wants us to, to find who he's called us and designed us uniquely to be and to be that. And I believe that the public school system beats that out of us. It was my experience. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, but I just feel the need in this season especially to guard the flame in my children's lives, to guard the unique gifts that God has placed in them. I actually, <laughs> the Holy Spirit was talking to me in the days um, up to, because I wasn't planning to say this piece, it wasn't written down, but I just heard um, like guardian and like the Holy Spirit was calling me to be a guardian. And so I looked up what guardian means and it means to be the keeper of a person or a thing. And I just thought about that, the keeper. I am the keeper of the flame in my child's life. You are the keeper of your flame. Now, does that mean if they're in the public school system or if they're getting in a different kind of education that you can't guard that flame? No, of course it doesn't mean that. But I believe in this season, God is calling me to, to pull my kids close and to stoke 
the fire in each one of them, to stoke that flame, to have them ask hard questions, to have them raise their voices, and, and to find out who God's created them to be. So that is my number six reason. All right. Uh, you guys, I really believe that in the future and just the way of the future, we are going to see a lot more automation. We are going to see computers that are able to do a lot of things that humans have been able to do. We don't need kids that can regurgitate numbers and facts. Computers can do that. We don't need kids that know how to like sit down and conform and behave. Although character is like a top of my list of important things. What we need are free thinkers, innovators, inventors. We need problem solvers. We need kids who are able to not be distracted and like living in zombie land, like in screen world, but kids who know how to venture. And anyway, soapbox, let's move on. <laughs> I wanna raise kids who are a voice in their generation. So uh, something God is calling me to do. Our education system is limited but at homeschool, I can teach my kids that their questions, their thoughts, what they're interested in, it all matters. And in fact, it might be part of their call in on this earth because we're on this earth for a reason. Um, that's a message for another time. Number seven, let me take a quick sip here. <clears throat> Number seven, and I alluded to this a little bit in my first video, um, but Homeschooling will allow me to educate my children at a pace that is right for them. I, I mentioned before that I have a child who has a significant learning difference. Uh, he has dyslexia. He has a problem decoding. And so his brain, um, his brain just works differently. And so I can bring him home and teach him at a pace that doesn't uh, shame him and also on the flip side. I have another son who He is an exceptionally fast learner Academically, he is always kind of been at the top of his class. He is a reader and a thinker and um, He often is finished before everybody in his class And so he has to wait for everybody else to catch up and he gets to read a book or take a nap or all these different things But at home I can challenge him more in that gifting and the other thing that I can do on this um, in this whole area and something that is very very important it's one of my most important values in educating my kids and in in affirming them in their identity is that I don't ever want to communicate to my children that just because someone is more gifted academically that they are more intelligent because that is a huge lie that really messes with a lot of people. So although my oldest son is very, very gifted and that's part of his intelligence academically, uh, he is not more smart than my other children or my middle child in particular, who uh, academically learns differently, but he, as I mentioned before, is brilliant with problem solving and ingenuity and uh, making something from nothing. Something that uh, he has taught me, uh, <laughs> which was a frustration in the past because he would rummage through our recycling or he'd rummage through things that uh, we were trying to throw away and he would try to rescue them and uh, and we've had this conversation. Like, I think he was maybe five when we had this conversation and the Holy Spirit began to talk to my husband and I, but uh, he would want to like save things. And we, we thought it was like a hoarding problem and we were really worried about it. And still he kind of does have like a collecting issue that we do need to kind of, you know, make sure is healthy. But when we said, this is just garbage, son. He said, you know what? If I take it and I repurpose it, then it won't be garbage anymore. And that's what he does. Uh, he just turned a box into a go-kart. And even just a couple days ago, <laughs> he took a soup can and made a drum with a balloon. And he's just, he is just so creative. I have another son, my youngest son. He is incredibly body smart and like, 
rhythms like he just picks up music really quickly and he's very much like his dad that he's kind of always moving he's got a rhythm in his head uh, Gardner in psychology he identifies eight different intelligences of the human experience and Kathy Cook uh, it's Kathy with a K and her last name is spelled K-O-C-H. She has written a book, I haven't actually read the book, but um, listened to her podcast. Uh, she's a doctor that kind of takes those foundings the, the, uh, of Gardner and she identifies them in a child's life. So um, there's Body Smart or uh, there, you can check it out. So uh, a really good resource, um, I think I, Pulled up the name of it. It's called Eight Great Smarts, uh, and it's a way for you to discover and to nurture your child's intelligence, and a way for you to affirm your child in their gifting. Because the public school system really affirms like one or two different kind of intelligence, and then like I think almost like the majority of kids that don't really thrive in that learning capacity or stream just kind of become muted and then we know that you know they're just because someone is really gifted in the world of academia it doesn't mean that they're going to be super successful interpersonally or relationally or in a multitude of different ways we know that life is more than just knowledge life is like think about Think about like how important creatives are and artists are. I mean, I've heard people say getting an education in art is a waste of money. And to be honest, I'm not gonna argue that. I don't think you should have to go to university, but creatives drive our human experience. Think of the world without music or think of the world without like movies and entertainment. Like that's all creatives who, who make this life beautiful. We all need each other. And do you know what that just speaks to me? I know I'm talking really quickly, but I just hear the voice of God talking about the importance of, of the body and how every person in the body of Christ is valuable, not just one type of person, but every person, every joint supplying, and that's how it ought to be in society, that we don't have, like, we don't rank people in position of their IQ or, or their, their status financially. We see the value and the need of, of those hardworking people in every area of life. And you know what, I think uh, this pandemic has really revealed uh, what is essential, which I kind of hate that term, everybody's essential, but there are a lot of jobs that we've placed a ton of value and prestige on that we're like, so anyway, I totally got off on a tangent and I wanted to really keep this short. So let's keep moving. Uh, yes, I, I can teach my children at a pace that they're ready to learn at. And I can also affirm them in their unique intelligence rather than have one of them get a big head because they're really gifted academically and others feel like, oh, I'm not enough academically. I mean, that's one small part of life is book smarts. So, I mean, we all need each other. We all need each other. All right, number eight, the eighth reason why I have chosen to homeschool my kids. And let me just take a little sip of my delicious coffee here. Hmm. Uh, the number eight reason why I've chosen to homeschool my kids is for me, nothing is more precious to me than to have the hearts of my children. So I think that if you haven't ever done this, this is a really important practice and maybe you should just pause the movie after, um, after I ask this to you and, and just stop to evaluate. But um, I think that it's really important. Oh, here comes uh, pause. Yep. Cheetah, are you hungry? Yes. You got a little boogie there. <laughs> Thank you, son. <laughs> no! You're going to make my glasses grow. Okay, welcome back. I uh, have had a few interruptions, but that is par the course. 
when you have little beautiful people around and so they are fed they are playing again outside i've got the little fur baby getting dog hair all over me life is good let's jump back we were at number eight and i was sharing with you that there's nothing more precious to me than to have the hearts of my kids and i really do feel that way and homeschooling really will allow me the opportunity to be involved and to have uh, vision for their uh, hopes and dreams and to be included in the things that they're passionate about and to make way for them. Um, what I was going to ask you before we had our little interruption was, have you ever stopped just to pause and to ask like, what are your parenting goals? What do you want to see uh, what would be the dream? And I, there's nothing guaranteed here, but I think it's important to have a direction to aim for with our kids. Uh, Psalms talks about our children being arrows in our quiver and that we are to shoot them out in the world. So what direction are, are we shooting our kids? Uh, I think that it's important to stop and to evaluate that. I love Andy Stanley. He has this goal that when his kids are launched out into the world, they will want to come home. I think that's a really important goal that our kids want to come home even though they don't have to. And I was listening to this podcast where a pastor was sharing about this couple who really drove their kids to succeed in school, especially academically. They were always scheduled in something. So if they weren't doing homework, then they were at music lessons or at sports, and they were just very, very, very scheduled children so that they would be successful in life. And now the, their kids are very successful, highly successful in high paying jobs, but their parents don't have relationship with their grown adult children, which that is so sad to me. Um, it's been a decade, the pastor was sharing, it's been a decade since their parents have been able to contact their daughter. She won't answer their phone calls. She wants nothing to do with them. And to me, that is just a, a very sad reality. I don't want to trade relationship with my kids for, um, the idea of success in the way that the world dictates that. That's not what success looks like for me. I, for me, success looks li like having uh, raised men who are full of character and strength and integrity, who um, love people and who love Jesus Christ with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, something that I pray over them um, almost daily is that they would love and know and serve the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's my goal as a Christian mom. You might have a different goal, but evaluate what your goals are for parenting because I think without even realizing it, we're just kind of on this conveyor belt and, and we, we put our heads up one day and our kids are launched and out in the world and we're like, huh, wow, that kind of happened quickly. And so I think it's important to be intentional, to, to see what some of the goals are. And not that we, again, we can't dictate what the future of our kids' life is gonna be. We want them to make their own life decisions, but I wanna set them up so that they understand that success isn't determined by this temporary reality that we're living in. We live for eternity. I believe that as a Christian with all my heart. And I believe that the only thing we can bring to eternity is, is we can't bring cars, we can't bring houses, <laughs> we can't bring any of our accolades or any of the things that we've earned. All we can bring with us are our relationships. And it's so important to me that my kids, my grandchildren, their grandchildren for generations to come uh, know the Lord and um, that we'll get to have a relationship forever in eternity. Now, if that's something that sounds like ridiculous to you, uh, maybe I will do a video about eternity and about, because 
at the beginning of this year, I've really took a deep dive into eternity. If that's something that you'd like to learn more about, heaven, heaven as the way that God actually lays it out biblically, <laughs> not even that we've learned about in the church in general, but uh, eternity is going to be amazing. And if you want to know more about that, just let me know and I can do a video on that too. But I really want the hearts of my kids and homeschooling will allow that. And so, yes, I want to have an emphasis on character, on, um, on integrity. I want them to, to be kind to people. I want them to love humanity around them, to love the one in front of them, not to ever think that they're better than anyone. Um, and I think the public school system, oh, my phone is dying again. I think the public school system really does um, kind of have a way of inflating the ego or deflating the ego based on performance. And that's just just not what I, I want to enforce in my kids. I wanna have their hearts and I want them to know that um, integrity far outweighs a, a big paycheck. It's interesting because um, the Alberta education minister just had an announcement. They're doing a curriculum rewrite and that's something they really want to emphasize in the curriculum is character development. So just as an aside, if you are in Alberta and you're worried about like staying up to date with curriculum, they are changing it all. So <laughs> there's going to be a huge hiccup anyway. So that's also as an aside maybe something you don't have to worry about so much but uh, one of the things that was said in that press conference was that what good is it to have an employee who who is brilliant at math if they're just gonna rob you blind and so uh, i think those are important things and uh, i'm glad that we are having an education system that is taking note of that but i want to acknowledge that Number nine, we're almost done. <laughs> Number nine, uh, homeschooling my children will not mean that they won't attend a post-secondary institute. Now, I included this in my list because it was actually something that changed my mind because I had this understanding, I don't even know where it came from. I had this understanding that if I homeschool my kids, it would lessen their opportunities for a post-secondary education if they wanted to be, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or to have a job that demanded a, a strong post-secondary education, like a master's or doctorate or whatever, I just want, I wanted them to be able to have that. And of course, that is an opportunity for them, even if they're homeschooled. And you know, it, it's strange that that was even a belief, it was just a lie but it's strange that it was something that was even there because my husband, uh, who is a phenomenal man, was homeschooled. He went to post-secondary for business, for Bible college. He was able to do all of these things. He came into high school, challenged, um, challenged the diplomas, like did very, very well. Um, and again, it was all through homeschool. So it's just kind of crazy talk. It's just misconceptions that we allow ourselves to believe. And also it's a really, really important, I believe we are living through one of the most major disruptions in the post-secondary education system that we've seen at least in the last century. Uh, because of the internet, we, I mean, and COVID has really kind of exposed a lot of this as as courses have been driven online and people can take courses online and we're realizing the amount that you can learn online, not necessarily in a classroom, especially post-secondary when classrooms are like hundreds of people and you don't have, you know, huge access to your professor. Um, you could have the same amount of access online we're really seeing a huge disruption. I really think that the idea of spending hundreds and thousands of dollars on a post-secondary education in 20 years will be uh, ludicrous. I think that the idea that we've ever done that, that gone into like crazy amounts of debt, you know, 
basically spent a house payment on getting a post-secondary education will be unheard of. Uh, Nathan was telling me he was reading this uh, article about Google putting out uh, courses on the internet now that they are going to train people in six months to a year, they'll get certified for a particular trade. And so we are living through this now. This is already happening now. We are seeing already a, 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 a huge erosion of the value of a post-secondary education. Not saying it's not valuable. Education is always valuable. But something that you might not know is that in Canada, we are the most educated country in all of the world. So in the whole world, Canadians are the most educated. Um, however, that being said, our unemployment rate is between 12 to 13%, which is massively high, which yes, we are living through a pandemic and that speaks, that affects it all too. But I just think that it's interesting that professions that we thought were secure because of a secondary education, post-secondary education, we thought that they were secure. We're seeing that maybe they weren't so secure. And so anyway, all of that to say, that actually was a pretty big thing that changed my mind. And even just the idea of like an Ivy League education, basically it's just a brand. It's just a brand. It doesn't mean that your education is more valuable. It just means that it was more expensive. Kind of like a designer bag. Um, you know, my purse does the same thing as a designer purse, but it just cost me 20 bucks instead of 200 or 2000. So for, you know, all intents and purposes, ed post-secondary education, I think we're gonna see uh, really, really changing and so anyway, if that's one of your concerns for homeschooling, I hope that that kind of eases your concern. Number 10 and my last point and hooray, I, I land in the plane, but I think that of all of the, of all of the objections for homeschool, the one that comes up again and again and the one that I've heard reiterated again and again in my research and the ones that I think are the loudest is, what, you're gonna homeschool your kid? How will they be socialized? We've all met that homeschooling child who we're like, huh, okay. But to be fair, there are a lot of weird kids in the public school system as well. So I don't necessarily know that that's a homeschooling thing, probably more a personality thing, yeah, and maybe the home atmosphere helps with that. Something that has been a value for us though in our home is that we raise kids that aren't insulated in a bubble. We want them to be in the world but not of the world. We want them to be set apart, consecrated so that they're bright and that they can be a shining light but also in the world. We are called to be the light of the world. So how are we being the light of the world if we're stuck in our homes all the time? That's not a solution either. So. I believe we can homeschool and also be social. Um, of course we can, <laughs> whether that's through sports, through including being part of a co-op, being very active in our community or in our churches, or you know, just getting out all of the time. I think socialization is a massively important part of education. But something that I wanna call out that I think is largely overlooked is that Public school has not done a great job of socializing our kids. I want you to just think about it for a second. Where else in society do we see children hanging out only in their own age group from year to year to year? That's not really realistic. Once you get out of high school, you realize, wow, there's a whole world of other people with other perspectives and in other age groups. Oh, here we go. Hey, Bubba. Hello. How many kids in the public school system are terrified to sit down and talk to another adult? Either because they think adults are boring or because they're just afraid of adults because they're the ones who make the rules. Something that I have noticed in my experience is 
how warm homeschoolers are when they sit down. They'll sit down, have a conversation with me, look at me in the eye, treat me like an equal. And that is something that I actually am looking forward to teaching my children because I see <laughs> that my kids don't really hang out with other adults. They would rather hang out with kids their age, which that's fine and that's great. But it's also important to teach your kids to respect children of other ages, whether they're younger or older. And that's actually what socialization looks like. Can I just say, I'm over this whole idea of socialization means that we teach our kids to have a low self-esteem. That's what socialization has looked like in my experience. Now I'll share my experience, that's all that I can share, but for me, I was highly motivated socially through my whole school experience and that meant that my attention for my learning kind of was backburnered. I was obsessed with fitting in with the crowd. I was, uh, I was very, very driven to be popular, to be liked, uh, to be accepted with the in crowd and as a result, um, I was far more motivated to be liked by people at the expense of being me. Because I was so driven to fit in, I wanted to look like everyone else. I wanted to sound like everybody else. I wanted to be like everybody else. My driving motivation was to fit in. I wanted to fit in. And I think that that's what socialization looks like in the public school. That's what it looked like for me. Okay, on the flip side, let me share with you my husband's journey. So at the age of 16, one six, at the age of 16 years old, my husband had his license, had a car of his own, was teaching at the most reputable school of music in the city that we lived in. I said teaching, he was a teacher. Uh, <laughs> he was leading at his church in the youth group. He was on the leadership team. And he came in to my high school, <laughs> 16 years old of age. He came into my high school to lead a Bible study at lunch hour. Now, from where I was sitting, I was like, who is this nerdy homeschool kid who comes into my high school, who passes through all the intimidating other kids <laughs> who are smoking out in the bricks? He had this knowledge that he was awesome that I didn't know where that came from. It was, it threw me. I was like, who is this guy that is like vibrant and incredibly passionate and unapologetically himself. I began to fall in love with the Jesus inside of my husband. Just as teenagers, we were high school sweethearts. We ended up going to colleges in different provinces, but God in his beautiful <laughs> kindness and mercy made us even more ready for each other and then we um, moved back to the same city, got married, and the rest is history. But my husband has taught me so much about the goodness of God that I have a voice that matters. He's been the one that's challenged me to stand up, to speak up, to be all that God has created me to be. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to God for the gift of my husband. But I'm also so grateful that that Nathan had parents who saw him fading away at the age of just 12. Uh, my husband at the age of 12, really, um, he, was, <laughs> he was settling for less than what God had for him. He had begun smoking, had a horrible attitude. He was a real problem kid. So his parents pulled him from the public school system and began homeschooling him and I really believe it not only saved his life, 
it actually championed the call of God on his life. So the idea that social kids are made in the public school system is just a huge lie. I want you to just evaluate your own child. What are the things that you see in your child? How can you champion that child? If God is calling you to cross an ocean that looks impossible, let me tell you, he is the God that splits the sea. He is a God that makes a way where there seems like no way. And I'm telling you this because I need to hear this because God is going to move on my behalf. I know that in this season and I'm trusting him that his plans are for good and not harm. You know, before I began to, to write out these 10 reasons, the Lord led me in my devotions to Jeremiah 29 11, and it actually inspired me just to write down 10 reasons and to share them with you because I believe that the Lord wanted me to share this with you. Jeremiah 29 11, I'm reading from the New Living. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, and they are plans for good, not for disaster. He has good plans. He has good things in store. The best is yet to come. We do not need to be afraid at the days to come. I think of Proverbs 31. We get to laugh at the days to come because God is there. He is making a way. They are plans for good and not disaster to give us a future and a hope. And so let me just end there. There are good things in store for us no matter what we choose. I don't want us anyone. I don't want anyone to feel like they are going to make a wrong decision because let me tell you, God is behind door A, God is behind door B. No matter what door you walk through, God is going to be there. Uh, even if you're not a believer, if you are crippled and like, I don't want to make the wrong decision, let me just give you permission to have grace because love covers over a multitude of sin. <laughs> love is that's a principle. That's a principle that works for everybody. Love is better than perfection. Okay, we can make a lot of mistakes as, as parents. There's no such thing as a perfect parent, but there are good parents and that's what your child needs. Just needs you to be, they just need you to be a good parent. To love them, to choose them. But I do believe that God has a best plan. And so ask the Lord what that is and move forward, like I said in the first video, with peace. Let peace lead you. Okay guys, I hope that's been a blessing to you. Uh, if you haven't yet, take a second to subscribe below and give this video a thumbs up. And, uh, and I hope to see you next time.